Hello there and welcome back to the channel. In this video I'd like to continue a discussion on collocations and collocation measures that I started in an earlier video. If you haven't seen that one go check it out first and then come back to this one. It'll make it easier to follow the content. All right let's go. Uh, there are three issues that I want to talk about. First of all I want to talk about observed frequencies and expected frequencies. You remember that last time I talked about different collocation measures and different frequency values that feed into those collocation measures. Those frequencies were observed frequencies and today we'll figure out how we can calculate expected frequencies. All right, so that's going to be the first point. The second point is going to be a comparison of different collocation measures. You remember that the last video ended somewhat abruptly with a black screen. Yeah, I know, my fault, sorry. Uh, and I was in the middle of comparing different collocation measures like mutual information, t-score and z-score and so on and so forth. So in this video, hopefully there won't be any black screens. Yeah. All right, let's hope. Uh, the third point is um, an example of a so-called directional collocation measure. All the collocation measures that I've discussed up to this point are symmetrical. Yeah? So something like pretty well, uh, we measure how likely it is or how unlikely it is to find, uh, let's say, 44 instances of that in a 12 million word corpus. But what we don't check out is uh, how likely is pretty in front of well or how likely is well uh, after pretty. And are those two the same or are they different? So that's what's meant by a directional collocation measure. And I'll give an example of such a measure. All right, let's go. Um, observed frequencies and expected frequencies. So from last time, you will remember this slide here um, that relates to calculating the collocational strength of a bigram such as pretty well. Yeah? What is the collocational strength of pretty well and what frequencies do we need in order to calculate it? Um, in this contingency table you see four colored fields that correspond to different frequency values that we can observe in corpus data. Yeah? So let's say that we chose a corpus and in that corpus we looked for the frequency of the bigram pretty well. Uh, that's this corner. We looked for the frequency of pretty on its own, yeah, just any instance of pretty, including those with well. Um, then we look for all instances of well, and then we check how many words there are in the corpus as a whole. Yeah, so and from those four frequencies, we can then fill in the entire contingency table and we arrive at uh, these numbers here for a sample of the BNC. Yeah, so the BNC A files give us these numbers. Right. Um, in the last video I talked about different collocation measures and how they make use of these uh, four observed frequencies, but now we um, want to know, well, <clears throat> given that we have 960 instances of pretty in the corpus. And given that we have 11,800 instances of well in the corpus, and given that our corpus is 12 and a half million words large, how many instances of pretty well do we actually expect to find? What would be likely? Yeah. Um, if you want to, you can do a little exercise here. So hit pause and uh, try to think about how many instances would you expect to find and how would you be able to calculate that, okay? So if you were to make a guess, yeah, how many instances of pretty well would you guess there are in a corpus of this size with the frequencies of pretty and well, all right? Okay, so you can do that now and I will continue now. Right, so there's of course a formula for that, but uh, let's think about this conceptually first. So in our corpus, and we can think of our corpus as a big old bag of words, that's what I try to visualize here, yeah? and in that bag of words we have 12,422,000. Okay, some of these words are 
pretty, yeah? and some of these words are well. Okay, and um, in order to find out the expected frequency of pretty well bigrams in this bag of words, we can actually just ask ourselves, well, what happens if we take two words out of the bag? Yeah? How many of those pairings that we draw one by one will actually be pretty well if everything is mixed up just randomly? Yeah? So we can uh, try for ourselves and you know, uh, pick three word pairs. So the first word pair would be the and see, then we get is and pet, then we get strong and who, and we continue with this, yeah? So <clears throat> how many word pairs are in there? Well, uh, half of how many words we have, right? <clears throat> so um, that is uh, what we would get. And some of these might be, just by chance, pretty and well, okay? Right, how many? How many? Uh, this is something that we can uh, calculate. And uh, the expected frequency of pretty well is calculated as the product, the multiplication of the frequency of pretty times the frequency of well divided by the whole number of, corp of words in the corpus. Okay? So um, this times this divided by that. Yeah. And if we plug in the numbers, if we multiply 960 by 11,000 something divided by 12 million and something, we get a value that in this case is 0 0.9. Yeah. So that is the expected frequency of pretty well. So given how frequent pretty is, given how frequent well is, and given the overall number of words in the corpus, we expect to find well, at best, one example of pretty well um, by chance. Yeah? And you can see for yourself, you don't have to be a mathematician to see that, well, 44, that's a lot more than one. Yeah? So in this case, the observed frequencies are a lot higher than uh, our expected frequency. Okay. So uh, here we have the expected frequency of uh, pretty, uh, pretty well, and there's a large difference. We can actually do similar calculations for the remaining four fields that we have in here. So how likely is it to um, have a sequence that starts with a word that is not pretty, but the second word is well? Okay, so something like is well or the well or some well or dog well, um, you get the point. Yeah, so also this can be calculated. Uh, for that, we uh, take all the words that are not pretty and uh, multiply them by all the words that are well and divide that again by the overall number of words in the corpus. Yeah? So you see this triangular configuration of uh, cells in the table that come into play here. Yeah? Uh, so compare these three, uh, that gives us the expected frequency of this one, and those three give us the expected frequency of that one. So in this case, the uh, expected frequency of not pretty followed by well is not that different from the actual observed frequency that we get, right? So we observe 11,803 and we expected, well, <clears throat> 43 more actually. Yeah, so you can see how that is uh, about one and this is uh, <clears throat> 43 more. Right, okay. Um, we can also do this for sequences of pretty that are not followed by well. So how many instances of pretty much, pretty fly, and so on and so forth do we actually expect? And uh, the expected frequencies are quite similar to what we actually see, a bit higher again. And uh, <clears throat> we can, of course, also do this for the last uh, cell here. So how many word pairs do we expect that start with something that is not pretty and continue with something that is not well, yeah? Is the from me, 
Yeah, uh, so all of these are in here. Uh, we observed 12.4 million. We expected 12.4 million. So this is the actual figure that we can calculate from this. All right, so observed frequencies, expected frequencies. I just wanted to clarify this uh, because, of course, the collocation measures essentially tell you whether the observed frequencies are different remarkably different from the expected frequencies. Yeah, that's really all there is. And um, well, there, there are some, some tricky issues, of course, hidden uh, in the formulas because there are certain assumptions that are built into the formula. So do we really expect all the words to be distributed randomly in a corpus? That is a gross uh, simplification. Yeah, so uh, anyway. Um, Wrapping up observed and expected frequencies, collocation measures compare observed and expected frequencies, and word pairs that occur with each other disproportionately often, they will receive high values of measures such as mutual information, t-score, etc. Let's move on to a comparison of different collocational measures. In the last video, you remember I talked about mutual information, t-score, z-score, and I also touched on log likelihood. Uh, below this video, you have a link to an Excel file that lets you calculate values for all of these measures given the observed frequencies that we talked about just a minute ago. Right, so um, now here are two screenshots from that Excel file. Uh, so we have collocations like sand shivers or oil companies or mountain range and they are ranked in the first table according to mutual information. So sand shivers has the highest MI value, clear day has the lowest MI value and in the second screenshot the collocations are ranked by the t-score. So pretty well is uh, the highest 6.5 and rather unsatisfactory is the lowest at 1.38. Okay, um, so in the last video I asked you to compare how these um, rankings relate to one another and one thing that you will have seen is that the t-score is fairly sensitive to the overall frequencies of the collocations. So pretty well occurs 44 times and it's uh, it gets the highest t-score. Oil companies 24. Uh, so the numbers they go down yeah, um, in the same way for the frequency of the word one, word two collocation and the t-score. That's not the case for mutual information. So they're the top entry sand shivers actually occurs only four times yeah? and still it has a very high MI value. So mutual information, collocation doesn't have to be frequent as long as word one and word two are relatively faithful to one another. Okay, so uh, what mutual information punishes where you get a low mutual information value is if the uh, individual frequencies for word one and word two are relatively high and then the combined the collocation frequency is relatively low in comparison. So for example, uh, so well is uh, a very frequent word. Yeah? And so even though we have 44 instances of pretty well, since we have more than 11,000 uh, instances of well, um, mutual information isn't all that high in the end. Yeah? Okay, so mutual information and uh, t-score. Here we have results for the z-score and for log likelihood and I'd actually like you to pause the video here and maybe go a bit back and forth, compare the values for all the four collocation measures and make a few notes for yourself. What collocations come out on top? What collocations come out more towards the bottom? of uh, the list and what similarities and differences do you see. All right, so do that now because I will continue in three, two, one, now. Okay, um, let's summarize a bit. Um, there are uh, pairs of collocation measures that line up more or less uh, if you look at these results. Yeah, so MI 
pairs with the z-score and the t-score pairs more with uh, log likelihood. So mutual information and z-score give you high values even for low frequency word one, word two combinations if word one and word two are very faithful to one another. Yeah, so that comes with uh, problems or at least concerns because if a word occurs only once in a corpus, it will have a high mutual information value for the preceding and the following word, whatever those words are. Yeah? And so mutual information really gives prominence to technical terms, idioms, proverbs, fixed compounds. So think of something like ipso facto. Yeah? Um, there you get mutual information values that are just crazy because ipso, yeah? where do you find that except in the company of facto? Um, by the way, Monty Python, a song about half a B, yeah, check it out. Um, right, uh, then we have t-scores and uh, log likelihood scores, and they line up with each other. So they're very sensitive to the frequency of the collocation. So if you find a pair that occurs lots of times, it doesn't matter so much if the parts by themselves are frequent too. Think of something like of course. Yeah. So, of course, off is super frequent, but still, of course, is a collocation. You know that, I know that, and also log likelihood knows it. So, uh, there you get high values for that. <clears throat> high values for high frequency collocations, even if the first word and the second word occur with other words. All right. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you uh, this graph and also a uh, web page that is related to this. So there's a fantastic book uh, by Brezina. It's, it's called uh, Statistics and Corpus Linguistics, a Practical Guide. came out uh, two years ago, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. And um, one question that may have been on your mind all this time is, um, well, you have all of these different collocation measures. Which is the right one? Yeah, which one should I apply? And um, yeah, you may have uh, anticipated this answer, but there is no right or wrong, really. Yeah, so which collocation measure you pick depends on what you want to find out, what your research question is. So um, there's no collocation measure that is better or worse than another one. There are just collocation measures that are useful for a specific purpose and not so useful for other purposes. Yeah? So what uh, Brezina has come up with is this uh, graph, which is a coordinate system that shows you what these collocation measures are sensitive to. So we have a frequency axis, very frequent stuff, very infrequent stuff, and we have an exclusivity axis. So here are things that are very faithful, collocations that are very faithful to each other. And here are collocations that are not very faithful to one another, even though they like to occur with each other. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's look at this. Um, collocations that would be completely faithful to one another are things like okie dokie or ipso facto. Yeah. Um, bon appétit in English, yeah, not in French, just in English. Um, all right, so those would get high values for the z score, they would get high values for mutual information, um, especially when they're infrequent, they get super high mutual information values, yeah. Um, right, if we go over to this quadrant here. We have log likelihood and the t-score in an area that says, okay, we get high log likelihood values, high t-score values when the collocations are frequent and they need not be very exclusive, right? So something like new idea, um, new occurs with a ton of words, idea occurs with a ton of words, but they also occur with each other, right? Okay, um, and new idea is probably not even that frequent a collocation, but still, yeah. Uh, something like off the is a 
perfect example of a collocation where both words occur lots with other words, but of the is still a pair of words that you find very, very often in any given corpus. Okay, so there you get high t-score and high log likelihood values. Right, I want to take this opportunity to show you the uh, companion web page for Brezina's book. <clears throat> Let's see, here we are, yeah. Um, if you just, sorry, if you Google statistics, corpus linguistics, Lancaster, yeah, here we go. Um, you will get to Lancaster Stats Tools Online. That's where you want to go. And there is a writer that says toolbox. And in that toolbox, you have a collocation calculator. So that's similar to the, um, uh, Excel sheet that uh, you have in the comments below, yeah, except that it's online and it gives you a bunch of other features that are really nice. So let's just, um, for the sake of it, um, <clears throat> play around with this a little bit. So remember the uh, case of pretty well that we talked about. So our corpus has uh, 12 million four hundred. 22,985 words. I put that in here. Then uh, we have pretty as our word and that uh, had uh, 960 tokens. We have well and well has 11,800. What was it? 47. Thank you browser who remembers everything. And then we have the frequency of the collocation. Yeah, 44. Window size, uh, we don't need that for all collocation measures, but we can specify it. So let's just go ahead and say zero and one. Yeah, pretty and well. And um, yeah, why not? That's correct for window size. And calculate associations. And what the web page gives you magically are the observed frequencies. Yeah. And also the expected frequencies and here you can actually check if what we did a couple of minutes ago is correct so it gives us 0.91 uh, as the expected frequency for pretty well so yay um, and then also the other expected frequencies <clears throat> and down here I mean that's the meat and potatoes here we get the different association measures. So mutual information, 5.58. Yeah, we calculated that. The T-score, the Z-score. Yeah, see, now you're looking at this and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. That's fine. Um, log likelihood. Yeah, so compare that. There are two different log likelihood measures. You can compare that to the log likelihood measures in the Excel sheet that we have. Um, and a few others. Yeah, so there is not only mutual information, there is mutual information squared, cubed, yeah. <clears throat> things that corpus linguists do when they have nothing else to do. They invent a new collocation measure. Yeah. And then there's this, we'll talk about this, delta p. Okay, that's next in our discussion. Anyway, I wanted to show you this. Yeah, so there are lots of more uh, things to do. I suggest that you check that out at some point and uh, play around with it. So last topic for this video, directional collocation measures. Um, again, I have a little exercise for you. I want you to look at collocations like these here. Commit suicide, burst out laughing, spill the beans, make a difference, keep a promise, take a chance, pay attention. <clears throat> Don't worry too much about the uh, third words. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, uh. Um, think of spill and beans, burst and laughing, commit and suicide, make and a difference, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> tell me, or tell yourself, explain to yourself, what is different about these collocations? The first three, and then these four down here. Okay, so take a minute or two. Think about that, and once you're done, you can uh, come back to this video. All right, I will continue now. So, with the first three, we have the first element, which strongly predicts the following element. So if you hear a word like commit, 
There are only a few words that can follow. You can commit a crime. You can commit yourself to the project. You can commit suicide. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. So there are not many things following commit. Suicide is one of them. I should have chosen a less morbid example. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to make up for it with the second burst out laughing. Yeah. So he burst out. What can come there? Yeah. So it's laughing. Pretty much nothing else. Uh, spill. Yeah, of course, the, the, there may be different things that you can spill, but spill the beans are still a high transitional um, probability from from A to B. And the inverse is true for make a difference, keep a promise, take a chance, or pay attention. So the second element has a strong preference to go with the first element. So promises are kept. Yeah? Chances are taken, attention is paid, and so on and so forth. But you can make anything, you can keep anything, take or pay anything. So the collocation is not symmetrical. Yeah? Do you see that? So for something like ipso facto, that would be completely symmetrical, right? Uh, ipso only occurs with facto, facto only occurs with ipso. So that's a two-way street, but with these guys, it's really a one-way street. Yeah? So either um, the first one predicts the second one, or the second one predicts the first one, even though in ordinary speech, of course, the second one cannot predict the first one because the first one is already there. Still, in principle, right? Um, so what can we do about these? Um, there are two types of collocation measures, and one I have talked about up to this point. Namely, um, things like mutual information, t-score, z-score, and log likelihood are what we call symmetrical collocation measures. So these measures don't take into account any difference in transitional probability from A to B or from B to A. They treat them just as uh, a pair, and if that pair occurs more often than will be expected, then that gives you a high value. Yeah? Um, directional collocation measures are sensitive to uh, the sequence of items in a collocation. So which word comes first, which word comes second. And there's an example that I want to talk about, and that measure is called uh, delta p. Right, here we go. Um, so by now, you know your way around this contingency table and the colored fields. And what we want to do is calculate delta p values for the collocation of cores. Okay, so um, by now you know that there are certain frequencies that we need for that exercise. We want to find out how often do we find the collocation in the corpus. How frequent is of course as a collocation? How often do we find the word course on its own? Yeah. How often do we find off on its own? And how many words are there in total in the corpus? Right. So those of you who are my students, yeah, please uh, fire up the old ANCOC um, and uh, load the BNCA corpus files into it. So <clears throat> choose open directory, navigate to uh, wherever you've stored the folder BNCA, and uh, then your and conk window should look like this. Yeah? If you're not my student, if you still have and conk, take some corpus that you have lying around. If you don't have any corpus lying around, I don't know why you're watching this video, dude. I mean, come on. Um, right. So this is what it should look like. <clears throat> and uh, then set the tag settings to hide tags. Again, if you're my student, if you're not my student, do what you like with uh, your corpus. <clears throat> and then search for of course, okay? Might take a while because uh, the corpus is large and uh, yeah, off, it's a frequent word. So here we are. So I get uh, 2,990 instances for of course, and you should too. Um, right, so again, now you should hit pause on this video and uh, fill in the rest of the table. So look for 
the overall frequency of the word course and the overall frequency of the word off and then um, fill in through subtraction the numbers that we need here in the contingency table. Uh, pro tip, <clears throat> you can actually, if, if you have several words that you're searching for with ANCONC, you can actually just uh, create a word list and then in the word list uh, tool there is a little button that says uh, search only or find only or something yeah and uh, you can search for words like course or off in the word list and it will give you how many instances of off you have how many instances of off of course you have and so on and so forth yeah all right uh, so once you've done that yeah I'm going to continue uh, you will have these figures here. So I get 5,401 tokens of uh, course and uh, 396,000 instances of off. Yeah? And from this you can already see something. Okay, uh, Think for yourself, Okay, what can you see from these four uh, frequencies? I'm going to continue. Um, <clears throat> right, through subtraction, we subtract the smaller from the bigger number. We can fill out the remaining cells of the contingency table and we get this. And uh, this then allows us to calculate delta P. And there are actually two measures, okay? So one is the forward measure and one is the backward measure. Um, there is uh, delta P21. So, um, <clears throat> this, what this says, delta P21, is given that we have the first word, how likely is the second one? So how likely is it that off is followed by course? And if you were to answer this in plain English, you would say, hmm, off occurs with all sorts of words, so not very likely. For two, delta P21, we should get a relatively low number. Yeah, and here we have delta P one two. So, given the second word, how likely is the first one? So, given that the second word in the biogram is uh, course, how likely is it that the first part is off? And here, in plain English, the answer would be, well, pretty damn high. Yeah. Uh, so we have course as the second part. It's a good chance that the first word will be off. Right. Here's how we calculate this. So we need um, the frequency of the collocation, of course. So here we have 2,990 divided by the overall number of off tokens that we have. Okay, so out of all the offs, how many occur in the collocation, of course? That is the first term in this equation. And we um, subtract from that. <clears throat> uh, all the course words that are not preceded by off <clears throat> and uh, all the words in the corpus that are not off. Okay, so um, that of course is a tiny, tiny number. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and overall this equation gives us well, what I said earlier, a very low rating, a very low number, 0 0.0073, uh, meaning that it's not very likely that off is followed by course, even though off course is a collocation. So what really measures the uh, collocational nature of off course is delta P12. Yeah? So how likely is it that course is preceded by off? And here, we first divide the frequency of off course by the total frequency of course. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, so we divide 2,990 by 5,401, and then we subtract from that <clears throat> uh, all the combinations of off and another word that is not course and uh, the grand total of words in the corpus that are not 
course. And again, this will be a small number, but one that is a little larger than this one. And uh, overall, the, the, the figure that we get for delta P12 is uh, 0.52. And that for delta P is a very high number. Okay, so, <clears throat> right. Um, here are some examples of collocations that would get high values for delta P21, namely things like instead of, apart from, according to, or upside down. In each of these, the first element strongly predicts the second one. So there's a high transitional probability from A to B. And uh, the second set, of course, for example, old-fashioned or in vitro, here the second element has a strong preference to go with the first one, and there's a relatively low transitional probability from A to B. Okay, um, I uh, made a screenshot of the spreadsheet that you can download from the link below, and um, here you see that next to the mutual information t-score, z-score, and log likelihood, uh, there are two columns with delta P12 and delta P21. And here we have the, um, well, 007 uh, that was rounded up to zero, uh, 0 0.01. And the 0 0.52 something is what we have here. So this is of course with the frequency of the collocation, frequency of off, frequency of course, all the words in the corpus, and so on and so forth. So that's how to read uh, that, that, that spreadsheet there. Now there's something I want you to do, okay? A uh, little exercise. Think of five collocations that will exhibit high values for delta P12. And then, so no, no cheating, don't, don't take these ones here, yeah? Uh, think, uh, get your own. Um, and five other collocations that exhibit high values for the other delta P, delta P21 and uh, look up the relevant frequencies with AntConc. You don't have to use um, now the, the BNCA files if there's another corpus that you want to use. Uh, do it with any corpus you like. Uh, enter the values into the spreadsheet, compare the results for the different collocation measures, and uh, see if your prediction actually holds true. Yeah? If you are feeling about, does this work predict the other one? Uh, how does it go, vice versa? How does that actually play out in the numbers? So I want you to get a feel for the collocation measures and what they do. So please think of 10 different word pairs and see how that works in the spreadsheet. All right, so that will be it for this video. If you are my student, there's homework. <laughs> so for next week, please read chapter seven in Lindquist do the quiz for chapter seven, and watch the next Ancong video tutorial. All right, um, if you have questions, either put them in the comments below, or if you're my student in the quiz, there's a box where you can ask me a question, put it there. I hope this works for you, and I hope to see you all next week. That's it for now, bye.